It's a pleasure. Shalom, everyone. This is March 22nd. We are talking about Parsha Tzav. Tzav. And we have, um, this is, <laughs> I'm very fond of saying, this is a great Parsha. You would not <laughs> normally think of Parsha Tzav as a very good Parsha because it deals with uh, all the sacrifices and, and the details of the sacrifices, which are very, very complicated. Uh, but my theme uh, has been focusing on one item can actually give us the whole story. Um, and I was drawn to this whole item of chelev. Chelev. <laughs> and Ilana, you made a good, a good reaction. Chelev is the fat, the fat of the offering. And what's going on with that uh, in the uh, Torah? Why? Does the Torah prohibit this? And what can we say about this? And, and uh, before we even consider it is, it, is it giving us, is there a story behind the fat? Is there a story behind offering the chaleb? And uh, this is my suspense hook for the whole class. Yes, there is a story behind chaleb. You're going to be shocked by this, as I was, to discover this. Although I had heard pieces of this before, uh, I, in exploring this in depth, uh, I have learned something uh, completely new. And uh, that makes this all the more exciting. You know, in the Haggadah, it says, uh, what does it say? Hello, I have any kaven shivim shanav, hello, zachiti shetehamer. Uh, um, I, I, I'm 70 years old and I didn't know, I didn't figure it out. Until Ben Zoma came. And I think that that's one of the most important things in the Haggadah. <laughs> the meaning of that passage is you're never too old to learn something new and you're never, never too old, you, you know, too, too expert in something or too, you know, knowledgeable to see a new facet of it. I wouldn't consider myself, you know, a, a, a professional scholar. You know, I, I certainly have read my share of this, but um, you, you, even if you've read it and you think you know it, you really don't know it. And, and I, I find that to be the most exhilarating idea. And, and I know, you know, we have a number of teachers, educators, students here. I mean, you're all involved in some way on some level. Uh, and uh, the joy of learning. I mean, you're, you're not here because you're, you, you want to waste your time. You're here because you have the joy of learning. So with no further ado, I'm going to present you fat. Fat, fat, fat. <laughs> I'm laughing only because Fact. whatever. Okay. Facts about fat. Fat, fat, fat. Here we go. We're going to share the screen. Oops, the daisy, wrong screen. Ha. Okay. Gonna be this one. Okay. <clears throat> Thought I set it up. Here we go. Let's do this again. Here we go. Sharing the screen. There we go. Chelev suet. Chelev suet. Suet. Um. So with the first mention of this of the word chelev is something that you might recall from chapter one, chapter four of Breshit. When Hevel brought his offering, he brought mibchorotzono. Bechor is the first of the firstborn. Okay, so the, the premier is the premier animals. And from the choicest parts of them, the the chelav of them, the fat parts of them, okay, which tells you something already from the beginning of the Torah that there's something interesting going on here about fat. That the fat parts are either delicacies or they belong to God in some way that they're special, and. Uh, uh, it, you, we, we require a little bit. Those of us who don't eat the fat of sheep need some kind of uh, tutorial in this, which I will give you shortly. God listens. God pays heed. I mentioned on Shabbat, and I won't get into this, but but I think we make a big mistake by teaching that story, Cain and Abel, as saying God preferred. 
Abel sacrificed the kin. It's not what's going on at all. The word is not preferred. God accepts. It's not what's going on at all. God pays attention to it, which is the same way that your child raises his hand in, a, you know, either at home or in a class, you know, your child, and the child's getting attention, okay? I mentioned this uh, in, in, in passing to a, a bar mitzvah kid, and I said that, you know, um, my favorite example of this was, you know, the, the, the bar mitzvah boy is getting attention, and the younger sibling is five years old and wants attention from the parent. Everybody's showering attention and, and love on the, uh, and telling the bar mitzvah boy how uh, great he is. He's 13 years old and his five-year-old brother, he wants attention and he does what a five-year-old will do to get attention. Namely, he wets his pants and that gets plenty of attention. You don't have to be a child psychologist to understand why a kid who is fully trained We'll, we'll, we'll do that, it's because he wants attention. I, I recall a very, very distinct situation like that in my previous pulpit. Okay, so here's another one. Eat the fat of the land. Remember, this is the context of Joseph. Joseph and his father, Joseph has, has, has told the, um, the brothers who he is, and they invite, uh, Pharaoh says to them, come eat the fat of the land. So chelev there is clearly the meaning of choicest, okay? You don't want to leave the fats of the offerings till morning. You want to burn them up. God apparently uh, is, gets insulted when you leave leftovers, okay? It's very, uh, I think that, that I, I understand God. God, God, when you don't finish any things, what, it's not good enough? So it's, it's, uh, it's leftovers. Then in the chapter 29 of Exodus, you have the, the ceremony that is intended for the ordination of the Kohanim. Now we're getting, we're getting into the guts, literally. Take all the fat that covers the entrails, the protuberance of the liver, and the two kidneys with the fat on them and turn them into smoke on the altar. You are supposed to transform this into smoke. And it's very interesting that the Torah uses the word vihiktir, vihiktarta, it's instead of visarafta, which is another technical term. Vihiktarta seems to indicate that we are talking about a kind of transformation of one element to another element. And that's what's going on here. You have to take the fat to do this. And here's the fat of the tail from the ram, of the fat around the liver, the protuberance of the liver, the two kidneys and fat, blah, 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 and the, and the, and the right thigh, all right? So in that ram of ordination ritual, which is, we're gonna read more about it next week, the, the, they do a slaughter of a ram in order to purify the priests. And evidently there are probably not coincidentally seven elements here, the fat, the broad fat of the tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the protuberance of the liver, the kidneys, the fat on the kidneys and the right side that has no fat. At this point, I should make a distinction between fat, the fat of organs and the fat of muscle. In the fat of organs, we call that chelev. The fat in skeletal meat is called shuman, shuman, right? In the modern Hebrew, a lot of modern Hebrew, shuman is simply any fat, right? The dal shuman is, you can read a yogurt package and it says, you know, 3% shuman, 3%. Shem, shemen, shemen is oil. So everything that is fat, yeah. That's right, shaman, shuman. Uh, so shuman is a technical term for, for milk fat or for, for it's, I don't know what the term for saturated fat is, unsaturated fat, we won't get into it. Ravui, rav, shuman, ravui. Shuman, ravui. Ravui, shuman, ravui. All right, so we're Why do we say about someone who is heavy, shaman, and not uh, halavi? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes if you eat a lot of halal, you get shamein, that's why. <laughs> so I don't know if, if, 
if the word chalav and chalev are, are related, it, it stands to reason that they could be related because, you know, we'll see, we'll see in a minute, you might be able to make the comparison. Well, we get, we get really into, big into chalev in Bayikra, okay? So, if you notice, the, the sacrifice for well-being, that's the, the feastal a, a sacrifice, that's when you want to say thank you. You had a you won the lottery. You got your you you were you graduated. You had a milestone. You got a, a promotion in your job. You want to pro, you want to provide a, a zevach shlamim. What were you supposed to do? Present the animal as an offering by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and the fat is that about the entrails, the two kidneys, is on them. In other words, this is a sacrifice that you get to eat, but you don't get to eat those things. You, those things stay on the altar. Uh, and you get to eat the rest of the meat, but you don't, you, go, you don't get to eat organ meats. What is called, by the way, in the lang, in, it's not, it's the technical term is offal, offal, O-F-F-A-L, O-F-F-A-L. And the derivation of that, is, it's something like it falls off. It's it, because when you slaughter as, you slaughter the 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 innards fall. It's offal, of offal. Okay, and then again in in a, in in uh, in this sacrifice of um, the if it's from a sheep, again chelbo al yat mima verse nine. He shall then present as an offering by fire to the Lord the fat from the sacrifice of well-being, the whole broad tail which shall be removed close to the backbone, the fat that covers the entrails, and all the fat that is about the entrails. Uh, the two kidneys and the fat they're on. Are we getting getting grossed out yet? Good. For he shall then present his offering from it as an offering by fire to the Lord, the fat that covers the entrails, the fat that's about the entrails. So what is going on here? We're going to go into chapter six. There's another, you, you, you are sacrificing fat. And then chapter seven, there's, I'm sorry, Marlene, go ahead. Is there a difference uh, scientifically when you burn fat as opposed to burning meat, does it not smoke up the same? I'm so glad you asked that question because my first inclination to answering this question as to what the what what on earth is going on here yeah, is to say it. you know on, in the in the experience of a barbecue and and there may who else barbecues here and it's been a long time since I've done that but but all you know, all of you who have experience with barbecuing meat know that. <laughs> You can put the steak on the barbecue and then, you know, you get it to a certain point where it sizzles and the fat drips off and flames, flames right? Up. So I actually think that there's something going on there with that. Um, and um, I think we're going we're gonna to hold that in abeyance for a second because I think I, while it's not the main idea, I, I think there's a case to be made for something close to that. All right. So what we have here is the, the, the rules pertaining to, to, this is in chapter seven, Torah Hashem, the, the guilt offering. And I'm not gonna read a chelav and mechaseh at of chapter in verse three, the fat shall be offered, the broad tail, blah, 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 the priest shall turn it into smoke. Uh, and then there's other things involved with it. Then there's, um, uh, the flesh of the sacrifice shall be consumed on the fire of the third day. Then, verse 23, verse 23 in English, speak to the Israeli people thus, you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat. Fat from animals that died or were torn by beasts may be put to any use, but you must not eat it. So there is a prohibition that you're not allowed to eat chelev and chelev, it's here in this, Daber of B'nai Yisrael, Lemor, Kol Chelev Shor, Bechesev, Ba'ez Loto Chelu. You're not allowed to eat fat. So the butcher, in preparing the animal, uh, uh, takes away the organ fats, not the skeletal fat, depending on the quality of the meat that you get. And you obviously know that you can get many, many kinds of different cuts. And, and of course, the quality of a rib, for example, rib steak is based on the marbled fat in the, in the steak. So fat is not a bad thing. Fat is a good thing. But the, again, the skeletal muscle fat is different from organ muscle fat. Organ muscle fat, you can't eat. 
organ muscle fat, in the context of Leviticus, it has to be consecrated or, or burned on the altar because all meat eating took place in the sacred priest. And one of the things that we forget, forget and don't understand is that the Bible is overwhelmingly vegetarian and only countenances the eating of animal flesh in the sacred areas. That is in Leviticus. It's not until the book of Dvarim that the institution of profane slaughter and the profane consumption of meat takes hold. And that is for a very obvious reason. One obvious reason is it's impractical to make everyone who wants to have a steak go to the sanctuary to slaughter the animal and eat it. It's just, it just makes it so, so complicated. It's a logistical nightmare. I think even the system that they have is a logistical nightmare. I mean, how many people are going to be sorry? I mean, you, you're talking about a pop can't be a great population if 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 there's sacrament. I mean, to burn a, a, an animal takes hours and hours and hours. So so the volume is really an issue. But besides that, Deuteronomy already foresees or reflects a more established state, a more established monarchy period, a settled period where the people are going to live all around the country and they're going to need to avail themselves of different resources. And you're not going to say to people, well, the only time you can eat meat is once a year at Passover and maybe Sukkot and maybe Shavuot and maybe, you know, if you so desire to give an, a, a sacrifice because you had a baby or you had, a, you had a, a, a celebration, then you'll come to Jerusalem. It's impossible. You know, I, I was just, just before listening to, to, uh, Israeli radio, and there was a, a segment on uh, they, they're, they're, I think there's a demonstration or there, there are people who want to build an airport in northern Israel, in Emek Israel. I just heard it this morning. Fascinating, fascinating. And, they, and the argument is really the same argument, which is we have one airport, one major airport. We're a modern economy. We're a modern country. I mean, in normal times, the volume of travel, the volume of travelers from Tel Aviv, from Ben Gurion, is enormous. I mean, now they're they're eight thousand a day, but but you know, in, in a normal year, the the high, you know, the the record year were millions and millions of travelers, and many of those travelers have to have to drive all the way from Matula to Ben Gurion to go and take a flight. Right? If you if you live in the Galil. And you want to you want to fly to the United States? You have to you have to you have to you have to drive a couple of hours before you get to Ben Gurion Airport. And the same is true from the south. Although in the south they all they have a lot is the airport now that's flying to Europe and other places. Mm. Uh, and and there's they're talking about another airport. Anyway, the point is that in a in a when you're when you have an established economy, you have to serve the economy in different locations and therefore uh, meat eating was impractical in one location central so therefore people were allowed to eat meat uh, in their own areas and they, were, they established rules for maintaining the preparation of that okay so all of this is about uh, what you can and cannot eat and this is a long long passage uh, about about what gets to be eaten, what gets to be sacrificed. And again, it's, we have the same theme. The theme is that the head and the upper part of the carcass, they, if it's a burnt offering, they go in first. The suet, the organ fats, plus the livers and kidneys go in second. And then the innards and other parts of the animal go third. And all of that gets thrown into, gets piled into the altar and lit up and ignited, okay? And that becomes a burnt offering. And this is true in verse four as well, in chapter four as well. I'm not gonna do this. What I wanna do then is show you, um, uh, uh, this is chapter, chapter seven. Again, in our Parsha, we have this, this whole discussion. All its fat shall be offered, the broad tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys, etc., etc. All right, so now you've been, You've been, and here are more, more highlights of Chelev. So what is suet? Okay, here you've been waiting for this, boom. 
in a recent episode, we made this meatless mince pie and we used vegetable shortening. Vegetable shortening is a late 19th century invention, but we suggested its use when suet is unavailable. In today's episode of 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son, we're going to be following up on this mince pie episode by looking more closely at suet. We're going to be looking at exactly what it is, what it isn't, how to prepare it, and the many 18th century uses for suet, both culinary and otherwise. Thanks for watching. Can you all see? Yeah. Okay, let me just... Uh... Suet is the fat from the loin or kidney region of beef and mutton. It's going to be a completely different sort of fat that you're going to find uh, on other parts of the animal, muscle fat. It's completely different. Oh, Although it sorry, looks the well, same, they're not the same at all. They have completely <laughs> different properties. They taste different, they smell different, and most importantly, they have a very different texture when they're finished. Here's a block of uh, rendered suet. This is very much like a, a piece of soap or almost uh, like a soft wax. It's very, very hard and set up at room temperature. But the uh, the regular fat that you're going to get, the muscle fat, when it's rendered, this is very different. This is, um, it never really sets up unless it's very cold. Uh, at room temperature, this is kind of cold in here right now, but at room temperature, it's almost liquid. So is it All right, that's, is it, we know that it's schmaltz, okay? That's schmaltz. And suet is not schmaltz. Suet is, is definitely not schmaltz. And it goes in suet is also different than lard. It's definitely going to have a different flavor to it and a different melting point. When you're shopping for suet, it's likely you're going to have to ask your butcher. You aren't going to see it out on the shelf. Okay, that's today. Today you won't see suet on the on the on the shelf because it's it's obviously you know I mean mikenbrechen. You know you know who wants to see <laughs> suet? It's it's as we all say fat. Okay, it's really. Yes, they go used, ahead. They used it industrially. That's why for many years, kosher people couldn't use SOS. Because That's right. they used animal fat. The tallow. The of, yes. Right, tallow, tallow. So so he goes into, he, he shows how it's rendered. Basically, he he, he cuts it, he, he shreds it. We'll just watch this here. Yes. Or smaller and pieces. There are little the filaments in Sometimes there. Also run okay, into and, blood he, and, and blah, 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 blah. blah. Other things that and then he puts it in a pot. Already minced up suet. Okay, suet. And he melts it, it low, slow flame. And then. Low, medium. Go to work. When you come home at night, okay. it'll be ready. Here it is your fat. Our suet okay. is all uh, rendered down here. It's all completely melted. Melted. Of course, and then what he, do, still, what he does uh, is he. He, he filters it, takes the gook out, and then so he puts it in a mold, to actually, and then he uh, makes take our cake, and then wrap it in paper, and then wrap that paper in linen for long-term storage. Suet preserved in this way can last a long time, several months, and they used it in the 18th century for dozens of uses. Uh, it's used in puddings, pies, uh, dumplings. It's also used in pickling and preserving. Here are some brandy peaches uh, that are sealed off with suet. And it's also used in deep frying and grilling. In addition to those, there are many non food I'm, I'm losing my appetite. I only want to say rusting inhibitor. The leftover graves as fish bait. Fish they even found an 18th century recipe where they used the suet and candles. They made an 18th century version of carpet paper. Suet was an important part of 18th century foodways and life in general. I hope you've enjoyed this. Episode. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Enjoyed it so, tremendously. So, so that I, I have to say, I'm sorry. You know, I'm going to just stop for a second. It's it's absolutely fascinating to see this because, first of all. The guy, I mean, is a wonderful presenter, and and we are in an age of missing information. We don't have this information. We, I mean, I, how many times have I said this? When you buy meat, you are at the end of a process that is, I don't know, it's got dozens and dozens of stages. Never mind just the farmer. From the time that the animal came onto 
out of the corral and got slaughtered, it's through dozens and dozens of things. And then when it gets to the store, it's packaged. You have no idea, especially kosher food. You have no idea what it's gone through, okay? And so, but what we're saying is that part of what it's gone through is that all that stuff is ruined. What you get, what, what's left is the meat. You get the meat, okay? Question, anybody? Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me go on, all right? So now I want to show you what, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a sheep looks like with a big tail. Have you ever seen something like this? That's the tail. Yeah, we're, not, we're not seeing it. We okay, always see uh, words. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hang on. Let's try it again. Try it again. Do you see the sheep now? Now I can. Yes. Oh, oh wow. Yep. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think I've ever seen a sheep like this. What's, uh, what's that thing there? What's that? What is that thing at the bottom? It's his tail. tail. His tail. Sheep naturally have long tails. Wow. And fat deposits in harsh for harsh climates. For millennia, we bred them to have longer and fatter tails, but eventually this practice was considered too impractical. Now tail docking has become the standard. Still around 25% of the world's sheep are fat-tailed varieties. So look at a sheep, okay? Oh, so yeah. we, the, it, you know, we have this picture of, of, you know, little cute little sheep. This is a disgusting creature. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With a big fat, I mean, well, you know, as my late father used to say, tuchus. look at the fat tuchus. look at the fat tuchus on the sheep. <laughs> okay. All right, and here, this is okay. unbelievable, okay? This is an Azerbaijani, this is fat of a, of a sheep. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Oh, wait a second, okay, I got, I got him up here, one second. I'm gonna stop for a second. I'll be right back, where is this guy? No, 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 no. no. All I gotta say is fat. Fat. <laughs> All right, be right back here. This can make you a vegetarian very easily. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being evangelistic here. Look at this oh. guy. Look at this guy. Boom. Oh, wow. That's lamb fat, okay? All right, he's going at it. This guy is happy. You can't believe how happy he is. He is eating this, okay? And I'll spare you all the, all the, uh, Okay, it goes. I'm gonna just do this here. Who's eating? Who's eating it? He's got people who eats it. He's slicing oh. it. Look at gorgeous, oh. gorgeous, gorgeous. He's got a whole. <coughs> okay, five to twenty pounds of toxic poop in their body. Okay, that's very moment. nice. But we're gonna go on here. <laughs> and he's preparing the food and the water, and we're probably gonna get another stupid ad like that in a second. He makes a shish kebab with it. No. Oh. Okay. Okay, isn't that great? And he spices it up. It's gorgeous. Look at that. Uh, Roasted, uh, dripping, dripping fat with the potatoes. Uh, uh, and he's going to eat the potato now with the dripping fat. Look at him. Azerbaijani. Unbelievable. He loves this. This is so delicious. <laughs> oh, my God. He's so happy. And look at that. That's a oh. spiced fat. And he puts it in the bottom of his altar. Okay, he had he had fires that reduced the coal. Okay, and that is his fat, and it's a beautiful scene. And wherever he is, and look at the the ready fat with paprika and paprika, salt, pepper, everything. This guy. Um. Bread That's fat. and fat. This is roasted fat. Oh. The roasted potatoes. <coughs> and this is what he's going to do. Just slice it up. Look at that. Look at that gorgeous. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous fat. Boom. What happened to and your rose colored glasses? Wait a second. He's making this into fillets. Right, he's filleting this. Okay. It's a, I, I, I can't imagine how many colors, a nice piece of hard bread, slices it down, he puts it on the bread, 
Look at that. Like like halibut. <laughs> it's not. And now he's gonna eat it. Unbelievable. Look at the broth that he made. Oh my god. He loves this. And he puts a little pickles on it. Where do you find this stuff? Oh, ah, you can find anything. You can the find it. cuts the fat. And he doesn't get a heart. Look at that. Hi, it's Sam Barker. Okay. So, so just a second. That is that is our dude with the with the uh, with the tandoori. I, that's unbelievable. That's so, just, uh, if he had the right clothes on, he would be the Kohen because he barbecued it all absolutely. and he ate it. No, okay. So he, the Kohen is not supposed to eat it, which begs the question: What's the story here? Look, it, it is a delicacy. They made it, the lamb fat, actually lamb fat, the fat of the tail, the rabbis, I, I, I got to research this more, but the rabbis do say you can eat that. Okay, so I, I bet the rabbis had, had a delicacy for that too. You know, look, uh, none of anyone here, uh, that's not the first thing you're going to make, okay? <laughs> okay, let, let me go on to, what's that? How high is this cholesterol? Oh my God! You know they they so so. hundred percent. They're not. They're not. It's not that it's um uh, they, they, the people that eat these things say that it's not it's not unhealthy. These kinds of saturated fats are not unhealthy. The the, the, the fats that are not healthy are the trans fats, the fats that become solid, right, Bob? That's more or less what. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's the, those are the things that are, you know, they're, they're processed fats. Those are bad. These are not, these are, I mean, obviously, if you eat a lot of them to only a diet of them, you'll, you'll, you'll you know, it's no good. But, but um, you know, people in the North, that's what they eat. They're, they're, their diet yes. consists of fats right. like this. Okay. Right. Trans fats are bad, but these aren't good either. These are not good. <laughs> these well, here's are organ, these are, this is Ophal. Can you see this now? Yes. Yeah. These are organ meats, and you can see the fat on the organ meats. Mm -hmm. And here is the, I bu I'm, I'm pretty sure this is a heart, not a not a liver. But this is this has got to be liver and, and other things. All right. If you're squeamish, don't don't look. <laughs> oh my god. All right. But but here I'm going to show you because at this point he's going to take the 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 animal innards out. Okay. And, and it's important to see this because you get the picture. This guy, I mean, and this is the difference. The difference is that priests, holy people did this. Here's a guy with jeans and, and you know, you know, there's music blaring in the back. And now he's, he's slicing open the animal. Notice that the air goes. Air, that's, that's the chelev. That's the insides. The chelev is that membrane and the fat. All that stuff gets pours out and it's filled with gas by the way you can see dropping out there on the bottom and then after that you have the cavity of the animal which is the carcass okay fun stuff okay mm. I'll, just, I'll share a you more from that okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> why so Maimonides says because he said exactly like you would say, everybody, it's bad for you, okay? In the Guide for the Perplex, he says as follows. The precepts of the 13th class, it goes through the different things. I maintain that the food which is forbidden by law is unwholesome. There is nothing among the forbidden kinds of food whose injurious character is doubted except pork and fat. But also in these cases, the doubt is not justified for pork contains more moisture than necessary for human food and too much superfluous matter. The principal reason why the law forbids swine's flesh is to be found in the circumstance that its habits and food are very dirty and low. That's according to Maimonides. So it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating that Maimonides makes this as the reason. The pig is a dirty animal, okay? We've heard that hundreds and hundreds of times. And of course, it's part of the traditional understanding, but it's, it's not the, the scholarly understanding of the book of Leviticus and, and the dietary laws. Law, law, the law enjoys the removal of the sight of loathsome object, blah, 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 blah. But if it were allowed to eat swine's flesh, the streets and the houses would be more dirty than any cesspool, as many may be seen by present in the country of the Franks. In other words, 
French people, disgusting people, right? <laughs> okay. A saying of our sage declares the mouth of a swine as dirty as dung itself. So no, no great love loss for the pig. The fat of the intestines in Hebrew, interrupts our digestion and produces cold and thick blood. It is more fit for fuel than for human food. We saw that. So the guy makes candles out of the tallow of the animal and that's what it's what's for. But you shouldn't eat it because first of all, fe. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting. And on top of it, my money said it's bad for you. But bad for you doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. And here, you know, I'm sorry to, to take issue with my monies, but if would God want something that was bad on the altar? It doesn't make sense. Right, the animal is a creation. You know, does that mean that it's bad? And why then would it? It, it just doesn't make sense. Okay, and then in that chapter, he goes on. He discusses meat and milk. He say there he gives his well-known interpretation that it has to do with idolatry, which is a different thing. It's a long chapter. Okay. Nachmanides has the same kind of gist. He says the term chelav is different from shuman. And then he says, chelev is the fat that's separate from the meat, covered by a membrane. We saw that and peeled off. And he says, the fat which can be separated from the meat, such as which is on the kidneys, is cold and moist, thick and coarse. It is difficult for the stomach to digest it fully, and it easily spoils. It also increases the white fluid. The ancients believed that a person's physical and mental constitution is determined by proper balance of the four bodily fluids, which exist in every man. These are the four humors, the red, the white, the green, and the black, which vary constantly in man and determine the state of health and disposition at any given moment. Since the eating of chelev increases the white fluid beyond the proper proportion, it affects the health of the person adversely and constipate. So in other words, bad for you, therefore do not eat it. Again, it's, 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 it's a, an attempt to explain something when they don't have the explanation. Okay, it goes on and on and on and on all time. All right, but wait, there's more. The reasons for serving suet for the deity, it must be determined, let me admit it, are shrouded in mystery. Philology, however, shows that the chelev, though inedible, was somehow associated with the best, the chelev of the land, the chelev of the wheat. The process by which the suet became the best is still undetermined. Conjecturing that this meaning is due to the assignment of the suet to the deity only begs the question, it leaves unanswered the initial problem. Why was a suet to begin with an exclusive reserve of the Lord? He doesn't know. He, does, he says he doesn't know. He doesn't know why it's so important. Now we have Mary Douglas. Mary Douglas is an important anthropologist. She died in 2007. She wrote some very important works in anthropology. And she says her point in the book Leviticus as literature, we got to take sacrifices seriously. Everybody who approaches sacrifices approaches it as a secular person outside of the understanding and the framework of their mythopoetic uh, understanding and their understanding of the world. And I've been trying to kind of teach this, this approach, which is they obviously took it seriously. It meant you know, as, as squeamish as we are and as disgusting as we find it, obviously it had tremendous power for all sorts of reasons, which I think are, are absent to us. We gotta take sacrifice and we gotta take the body as a symbol. Here she writes, the first chapters of Leviticus are largely about how to make a sacrifice, how to select the right animal, how to cut it, what to do with the blood, how to lay out the sections on the altar. To find the underlying logic, we have to look carefully at what it says about bodies and parts of bodies, especially what is inner and outer, on top and underneath. Pay special attention when it emphasizes by frequent repetition and strong prohibition. After the animal has been killed, flayed, and its blood drained, the burnt offering is cut up into sections. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and lay wood in order upon the fire. Like the guy, like that guy in that video. Aaron's sons, the priest, shall lay the pieces, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But its entrails and legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall burn the whole on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire pleasing odor to the Lord. 
This densely fact statement, it, right at the beginning of the first time we hear the frame about the meat being quartered, the priest laying the quarters out with the head, the suet fat, the wood, the fire, the altar. It soon comes again, cut it into pieces with its head and its fat. The priest shall lay an order on the wood, on the fire, on the altar. And the last part, once more, concerning the offering of birds in order, varying on the altar upon the wood is on the fire. And the same several times repeated in chapter three. This is, quote, the house that Jack built style. The cat, it's Chadgadya. She doesn't know Chadgadya, but she's saying in the Torah, this is a Chadgadya. The cat that ate the rat, that ate the malt, that was in the sack, the lay, Chadgadya, right, et cetera, et cetera. Chadgadya style yeah. is the house that Jack built style. And that is the way that the book of Leviticus is written on in terms of preparing the sacrifice. It's on this, this is on this, this is on this, this is on this. Repeated so deliberately in the prologue part of the book, it warns us to expect more of one thing laid successively upon another and that they will be organized in inclusive sets. It also says that Leviticus insists on due order in the disposition of the section body. This is integral to the sacrifice that you cut it up into a pieces, head, bottom car the top carcass, the suet, and then the innards. The verb to set up, to arrange, to lay out an order is applied to arranging the fire, the sticks, the section, the meat. Setting up the sticks for cooking fire is a skilled task, as every Boy Scout knows. Sheldon, right? The sticks have to be clear, cleverly laid so that they can support a lot of meat in a space that must be restricted because if the fire is allowed to spread around too much, it will go out. But information about the right order of meat is sparse. The rule for the daily burnt offering only says that the head is first, the fat. The sections are added to these. The last are the entrails and legs after they have been washed. In chapter three, the rules about suet fat going on first are expanded. The priest is told exactly what to do. He must present as an offering by fire of the Lord, the fat of the entrails, all the fat on them and that is on the loins and the protuberance of the liver. This is the suet fat. This rule is repeated three times, etc., etc. Okay. We repeat a few times, as you say, for the case of sheep and for a goat and for a bull of sin offering, the suet on the tail of the sheep is also banned in the Torah. The rule against eating suet is prepared is paired with that for blood. The people of Israel are prohibited from eating suet in the same strong terms as they are forbidden to eat blood. So we are we are all familiar with you shall not eat the blood, but we're less familiar with you shall not eat the fat. Why? There are two contending explanations, but they contradict each other. <coughs> We've already said Here's that it's... Thank you. This is fascinating. Uh, the, 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 some hold that suet is forbidden to worship your feet because it's the best reserved to God. And others hold that it's because forbidden it's because it's like, edible, like we said, okay? The, the, um, the offering. The, the, it's some, some hold that it's, it's the best or some hold it's because it's inedible. All right? That's what we saw in the Maimonides. Maimonides, it's inedible. But the Torah, it's kind of the best. Some texts support the first. Having the best is living off the fat of the land, right? We saw that. Ugly. Leviticus says that the suet fat is divinely selected for God. As to the other idea, suet is inedible. Try telling that to inhabitants of the polar regions who practically live on it. Or tell it to traditional English cook, which we saw, for whom beef suet was an esteemed ingredient in Christmas pudding, mince pies, dumplings, to say nothing of the crust of prestigious steak and kidney pie. Right? We saw him. He loves it. Blech. Suet is definitely edible. Like most good things, it is possible to have too much of it. The idea among Jewish Bible scholars is that, that it is inedible may explain why they regard it as a less important dietary law. They believe that divine decree saves them from eating something that is bad for them. So she, she takes a shot at these scholars. 19th century medical material rears its head again. Baruch Levine, offers an unlikely double explanation that suet fat, chelev, was desired by God. At the same time, the suet fat is not regarded as choice food for humans. Jacob Milgram, after a thorough survey of the literature, we saw his comment, I'm sorry, and he said, um, Jacob suet Milgram said, <clears throat> the reasons for reserving the suet for the deity are shrouded in mystery. We know better now than to look for a ca causal reason for why suet is solemnly prohibited. Leviticus proceeds by establishing a context saying where suet is found on the animal, that it is in a middle zone over and around the kidneys, over the entrails. This information must be important for it is given many times over. The obvious way of resolving the puzzle in concrete logic would be to study relative positions. 
outside the body is the skin, a container for blood, which is the life or soul. Under the skin is the skeleton, within which the rib cage protects the heart, lungs, and upper abdomen. Below the rib cage is the hard suet, which we saw, forms a middle area. It's in the middle, separating upper from lower. The fat, that hard chunk of fat is there, coincidentally, I guess, but maybe not, in the middle of the carcass. Two kinds of ordering are in play. One, the arrangement of the internal parts of the living being. That is the normal order of the animal's anatomy. And the other, their order on the altar. For the altar, in every case, the middle zone, the suet or fatty era is taken out first, and burnt on the altar. There are no exceptions to this. That's if you eat a, a, an edible offering. You always have to take it out. For a burnt offering, even though the middle part of the animal is burnt on the altar, the fat is mentioned as being already there with the head. So we have a technicality here with the burnt offering as it's mentioned. It's, it's, it's ordered in the same way. The rule is meticulously repeated for a bull, a sheep, a goat, uh, always naming the fat covering the entrails, the two kidneys embedded in the fat, the lobe of liver to be burnt on the... The orderly pattern made on the altar from a dismembered animal present present the innermost soft parts of the body under inclusive series of outer casings. The suet covered area divides the top of the carcass from the bottom, making it into three parts. The thick layer of suet around the diaphragm, which contains the liver and kidneys, making a middle zone, while the last zone are the other entrails. The procedures for sacrifice have broken up the order of the living body, separating each segment and drawing attention to the middle part which would not otherwise have been distinguished from the rest. Ramban's model of the holy mountain has been transposed into a tri-zone anatomy of the sacrificial animal. In the interior of the body is the pattern made by the suet covering the liver and the two kidneys. I'll explain this in a second. In the interior of the tabernacle is the pattern of its furnishing and activities. And both can be assimilated to the pattern of the holy mountain. If you go back to the tabernacle, and I'll show you a, 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 a diagram of the same, you have three zones in the tabernacle. The outside, the middle inside, and the Holy of Holies. The animal has three regions, the head and the upper, the middle, and the, the kidney, the, the lower parts, okay? The entry of the carcass, the enveloping skin has to be open, which would be correspond to the entering large courtyard, the sacred area. In other words, these are my italics here, the opening of skin is the opening of the courtyard. The body of the animal is the whole tabernacle. So she is making a radically interesting interpretation. She's saying, when you take the animal, you're representing the tabernacle itself. The animal is the whole building. Okay? At the entrance is the outer court, the place of sacrifice, where the animal is pierced. You shecht it there. It is an area much bigger than the sanctuary. On the animal, the corresponding front part is the enormous barrel-like rib cage containing the heart and the lungs. So the outer court is the priest and the late area. Both priests, Kohanim, and regular Israelites can be there. And that equals the upper part of the carcass. So you have three sections. We've, we've got the skin, which is everything. The outs, it's not even a section. But now you have the out, outer part of the court, which is the top part and the head. The animal shape is tapering up and towards the, uh, the withers. The withers is the, 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 the top of the shoulders. And note that the suet around the diaphragm makes an occluded zone. It's all packed in, like you saw. Beyond the suet and its contents, another small separate area of lower abdomen containing the entrails and loins would correspond to the other. So it's the entrails and the loins that are the, that are the equivalent to the inner sanctuary. It's the, we are adults here, so it's the genitalia of the animals. Okay, now she makes the following thing that will completely lop the top of your skull off, okay? It's Mount Sinai. It's the tabernacle, okay? Look at this diagram. At the top of Mount Sinai is the summit. And she says it's the, en in the entrails and genital organs at the top of the pile. And that corresponds to the Holy of Holies. The perimeter is the, dead, is the middle part. That's the midriff area. The sanctuary and dense clouds of incense. The lower slopes, open access. That's the head, the meat sections. All right? 
The diagram of the sanctuary is this. Look at this, okay? This is the outer court. This is the inner court. And this is the Holy of Holies, okay? So what she's saying is that between the inner court and the Holy of Holies, that's where your suet is. That's where the fire, that's where the smoke is, okay? And that corresponds to the mountain, the base where all the people are, the outer court. This is the steps of the mountain where, Mo, where Aaron and the elders are and the top of the mountain, which is not in this picture, couldn't find the real cloud here, but he's in the cloud. So you have the cloud, the se- it's three steps, the people, the middle and the top. The top is only for Moses and God. The middle is Aaron and the elders. And the base is all the people. In the sanctuary, this is the bottom, this is the middle, and this is the top. You get it? This is where only the Kohen Gadol, the Kohen Gadol replaces Moses. And this is where the cloud is, right here. And this is where Kohanim can go, which represents the elders. And this is where a sanctified person you, regular Israel, if you have to, if you want to give a sacrifice, you can go here. Okay. Now, here's my thing. This is the the this is the pile of the of the of the sacrifice. I'm going to start with the bottom. The bottom of the pile is where you put the head and the upper card of the card, the tachav, the rosho. So this is exactly what you put in the bottom of the pile. This head, the cow's head, and his rib cage. And that's the base, that's the people. And that represents the outer court, the altar, the regular Israelites in pure condition. The middle is the suet, liver, and kiddos, which is the chelev, the middle, which we're talking about. And that's the cloud that represents the cloud. The sanctuary, the table, and the menorah, and the clouds of incense are in that middle zone. And the top zone is the innards and genitalia, the genital organs, I used a female here. <laughs> The top of the mountain, Moses and God, the Holy of Holies, Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippur. So what's, what's brilliant about this is that it, it explains everything in, the, in, this, in this schematic way that I'm going to say makes sense. It says that the body of the animal represents the moment of the joining of the people and God at Sinai and the body of the animal as it's being burned is a reflection of where it's being burned in the sanctuary and God's unique relationship to Israel in the covenanting moment at Sinai. So here she says as follows. On this reading, the meaning of the cloud and its association with fire for the people of Israel are enough to explain the suet being forbidden. The suet that divides the body at the diaphragm below the lower ribs is not just a covering. It corresponds in the body to the boundary of a forbidden sacred space on the mountain. The solemn terms forbidding them to eat the suet fat support the parallel between the body and Sinai. The torso is a funnel going to the most intimate sacred area has a lot of meaning for Exodus. We see this, I showed it, I, I got that this is, you know, a, a depiction in, in this kind of way that it's a funnel going that way. It's a funnel towards the Holy of Holies. Okay, it's, uh, you know, most, most you know, diagrams are quite square, but here, if you're looking at it, you're coming in, it's a funnel to the point, uh, the, the infinite point, okay? The mountain goes up, ver- sorry, the, the tabernacle runs horizontally with a slight tilt upwards. The holy mountain goes up vertically to the summit. And the sacrificial pile starts with the head, goes up to the entrails, each interpreted by reference to the others in a figure of the same world. Mountain goes up vertically, tabernacle and living body go along horizontally. The three exemplars come close to the inexpressible paradoxes of Jewish mysticism, which allow going up to the throne of God to mean the same as going down to the chariot. If the tabernacle as a figure of Mount Sinai raises for the literal minded inquirer further questions about the location of God at the summit of the one and at the same time in the deep interior of the other, 
Remember that in mystical thought, the whole scheme of spatial orientations can be reversed, upper and inner can be equivalent. Look at this, at his creation where you will. The pattern is always there, God in the depths or the heights of all. Well, that's a breathtaking passage, okay? I'm going back to these, these uh, pictures because I think they're quite riveting, all right? And here she says as follows, that the suet is here. It's the boundary, the boundary between the regular holy and the holy of holies. And that the outside, that's the, the head and the upper carcass, okay? So now what we have here is, I think it's just a fascinating fact. I mean, I find this a very compelling interpretation. I find it to be, to be um, I mean, you know, it's not satisfying to say, well, they didn't eat fat because it wasn't healthy. Well, they didn't eat fat because it, 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 it belongs to God, you know. It's obviously much more than that. It's symbolic or something. And now let's get back to what Marlene and I have said at the beginning, which is, so there is something about fat, which, which I think it's flammable. So fat, when you put it on a barbecue, the muscle fat has a lower melting point and it will burn. The fat of tallow, the rendered uh, suet fat is probably just a little more potent as a, as a flammable and will give off just that much more light, heat, and smoke. What is the defining feature of the Mount Sinai experience? The fire enclosed cloud, or the cloud enclosed fire. So what you're doing with the suet, I think, while and, and here, of course, I'm not an expert because I've never burnt a tallow candle, but you can get a smoke out of it if you burn, if you, if you burn flesh and if you burn the smoke, burn the, 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 the fuel, you're going to get a, a fire, you're going to get a big flame, right? It's going to, right? And you're going to get smoke. And that's what you're doing on the altar then in a burnt offering is you're creating a miniature Sinai. That's what you do. Hmm. And, and, and therefore, the chelev is, is unbelievably important, right? And therefore, it makes total sense that you wouldn't be able to eat it because it plays that holy role. The same way that you wouldn't be able to eat blood because blood represents the life force, at least in, in the Torah's interpretation, although there, there could be other interpretations, the chelev represents the condensed, compressed cloud. And therefore, you can't eat it. Marlene. <laughs> Not because, and it sounds a little like uh, mystery to me. It's, uh... you, you, you're, you, you're taking issue with Mary Douglas? <laughs> yeah. well, so, so when you equate it with Har Sinai, that brings into every day our trying to reenact what we can't reenact anyway. Not true. We we have done it a different way uh, without uh, without the whole sacrificial system. So one of the great the great crisis in rabbinic Judaism was you stopped you, know, you, you couldn't make sacrifices anymore. What, but what, what the genius was, you can re reenact Sinai every day by studying Torah. Because when you study Torah, you get the content of the revelation without the sound and light show. What the temple is trying to do, what the sanctuary is still trying to do, is create around you, which, I'm sorry, this just around you, the, 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 they're going to create around you the, the, the smell, the scent, the, the light the sound of, of Sinai. I mean, it's a silent, remember I said last week, the sanctuary is a sanctuary of silence. Nobody's talking there. They're only making gestures there. And so there is mystery there. there, there I mean, as, as inclined as I am not to this, you know, the, to a more rational interpretation, you know, we're religious. Religion is based on a mysticism. Religion is based on faith. You believe in what you can't see. It's a mystery, 
right? One second. So, so, so here we are saying, look at the way that the animals laid out. Look at the way the participants are, are being. And this would have been self-evident to our ancient biblical ancestors. They would have gotten this. Look, in the, in the Torah itself, there are things that are, are there that they don't have to explain. They, don't, they never explain the word Pesach, by the way. They assume you know what that is, right? It's self-evident to you. So the worshiper kind of goes into the temple and they, they know that they're having this experience. The same way, for example, you know, a Christian who, who, who knows a little bit of Christianity walks into a cathedral and understands intuitively that they're walking into the body of Christ, right? Because as I showed you a couple of weeks ago in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, right? So all cathedrals are arranged architecturally as a cross, right? So you, you, the experience, you don't have to tell this to people. You don't have to explain to people their walk. And I think for generations before us, you don't have to explain that when you walk into a synagogue, you're going up to Mount Sinai. When you go up to Bahibin to Aaron, it's really recreating Sinai. You don't have to explain. Now we have to explain all of this because we've lost all of this information. You don't have to explain to someone why you use salt on the table for a mozi. Do you? Is the salt there just a condiment? No, the salt, you, you get it because, yeah, somewhere I learned that every offering was brought with salt. You do not have to explain why on Friday night, you, you know, on Shabbos, you use two loaves of bread. Why? Because it's so we know, because we had a double portion of manna on Fridays in the, in the desert. You don't have to explain that. Now, these are things that are, that are well understood. Look, even, even for Pesach, you know, we should all be well. So we're going to have matzah. So the truth is, the Haggadah goes out of its way to say matzah al shuma. But even the answer it gives is, in a, is, is not complete. Right? Pesach, Al Shuma, they're saying all this to get you going, get you started, get you talking, okay? The, the point is that all of these things are self evident. To, to Jews who live in, in a Jewish life, Jews who live in a Jewish life, the idea of, of removing blood from, the, you know, koshering meat, it's understood. Why? Because we don't need blood. You know, they don't, don't, nobody has to go into real details about it. So what I'm saying is that, that, you know, she is, Mary Douglas is recovering for us a plausible symbology, a plausible symbolic meaning to the whole structure of sacrifices and giving it a story. She's giving it a drama. She's giving it movement. She's saying, you, the person worshiping and offering, you are standing at Sinai now as you, as you pull, and that we, the people, when we do our Ola, our burnt offering in the morning, and we do our burnt offering in the evening, we're creating Sinai in the morning, and we're creating Sinai in the evening, and it's with us all the time, and we are here all the time, and that is at the core of our religious experience because the core of our religious experience is the covenant between God and the people. We can't go into the Holy of Holies every day, but we can certainly reenact Sinai in some physical way with fire and smoke, and at the same time be pleasing to God in a way that, that you know, has a vocabulary that is necessary for achieving these ends. I think it's very plausible. Ilana, go ahead. <laughs> uh, for some reason, I mean, I'm very impressed that you got to choose this word. How did you get to this word anyway? But I'll tell you what, I, I tell you how um, I got it. I was thinking of something else completely for, for today. And I always I always trust myself. When I, when I get curious about something, I say, drop it, f follow that. Because obviously, it, there's something pulling me in that direction and I, and I don't know, so I want to find out about it. And that, so I was, I was interested in why is it that we have elsewhere in the Parsha, it says you, when you touch the, the, the Mizbeach, you become holy. It's called contagion. That the, 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 the altar has contagion to you of holiness. I think that's very fast. I'll do that next year. <laughs> but, but, 
But I was thinking of a candle. A candle. Uh, it has the the chelev. Yes. And then it has the wick. Yes. And then you bring a fire to work it. Yes. So uh, also it has three stages that Correct. Um, may connect. I, I think that's beautiful. That's a beautiful, beautiful analogy. And the candle, by the way, is a controlled chemical reaction uh, with a fuel, with oxygen, right, and you know, and combustion, and and um, and it, it's it's the the sacrifice, while it's in it contained in the altar, it's an uncontrolled uh, chemical reaction. You tell, and then Bob. Right? Yes. So, <laughs> talk about being happy, Clara. So he's a real. <laughs> I'm listening to all of this and I'm watching the whole thing and the separation. And I'm thinking to myself, is there any symbolism here then to the bendel that the Hasidim wear is separating? Completely, and the completely, completely. It's all about that. Because, because your, your upper part and your lower part. So, but the problem is it's reversed. The, 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 Has, the mystical tradition from you know, post-biblical mis mystical tradition doesn't see the value in the procreative parts. They, 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 they are much more uh, condescending towards that. That it's, very, it's fascinating that you put the genital organs on the top of the sacrifice because they represent the mystical union of God and the people, okay? Now, I know that that's very difficult for us to kind of wrap our minds around, all right? In, in, in Hasidic and Kabbalistic mysticism, the Gartel, Bobby will explain, it separates the upper and lower spheres. And, and that becomes, you know, it's, it's in vogue now in certain circles. Yes, Bob. I was just gonna say uh, just a few quick comments. First of all, I don't think we'll ever do fat shaming again. <laughs> that's, that's my first humorous comment. The, the second is that I really like the linkage of sacred anatomy with sacred geography there's, there's... And that you and Mary Douglas, you know, have tied together with purity and danger. And I hope that in your Parsha talk coming up that you will explore whether or not the Sefirot are also represented within the tabernacle and by the organs. And the reason I say this is I ran something, read across something fascinating that said that each of the organs of the body are connected to each of the mitzvot in terms of the positive and the negative mitzvot. And so to what degree this, as the people are enacting this, they're not only thinking of Har Sinai, but they're also thinking of transforming themselves and the blood and the fat representing passion and pleasures being offered up. So, so I think it's fascinating, and and you know, Jeremy, my colleague Rabbi Komanowski, uh, he he is the more mystical of us. I'm the more Bible oriented, and and it's clear that Barry is is the more you know. I, I love part of medieval commentary, but he just knows a, a great deal. So we all have our different areas there, and, and I'll pitch it to to Jeremy to to talk about this. I think you're absolutely right. You know, the Sfirot represent. And have taken on the the the. If you've seen every uh, diagrams of the Sfirot, they're all represented as a human being, and of course the center is is where it's at. Uh, each of the organs are represented by another another divine emanation. You know, religious systems and mystical systems want to live in this kind of poetry. I mean, and and the body is accessible to to us as a um, as a narrative. The body is the framework for the human narrative. I mean, we live in our bodies. You know, it just so happens that we refer to the parts of our body, our head and our heart and our kidneys and everything else, possibly in different ways. In, in antiquity, as you probably are aware, you know, the seat of wisdom was in your kidneys. The seat of feeling emotions was, was there, you know, bochen kelayot valev. God, you know, searches out your kidneys because and I mean, why that was seen as the place of, of thinking is beyond me right now. But but you know we, we tend to think of, of you know the mind. We're so focused on 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 the, the brain. Um, so so obviously those things and those um, symbolic emphasis of, of organs. I mean I you know I I, I have uh, some experience with the heart, not personally obviously, but personally you know through Kim and and and. 
you know, we, we constantly marvel at the idea of the emotional life and the thinking life, you know, with the heart. And we, how often we use the word heart as a figurative element for so many things, the heart of the matter, the, you know, I take it to heart, that kind of thing. And so we, we, we simply, you know, you know we, we go through stages in, in human civilization where these things are broadly representative of certain things, but those representations change, yeah. I think it's fascinating. I think it's compelling. I think she made a great point. She was a magnificent scholar. And you know what, you know, I, I, we sometimes have weaknesses by not presenting enough women uh, scholars. She's not Jewish, but she, 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 she did flip the whole uh, biblical scholarship world on its head when she presented mm. this. This book was published in the late 90s, in the early 2000s. Um, and, and it didn't make it into a lot of the commentaries that I cite, the Milgram commentary, the JPS commentary. They, they simply, they, they, they poo poo pooed this, this interpretation. And since then, others have been working on it, I'm sure refining it. So, so I, it's absolutely fascinating, compelling. I think it makes sense. Uh, I think it introduces to us a whole, and, and by the way, and I'll probably bring more of this later on as we go, she says the whole, the whole book of Leviticus is organized as the sanctuary. The first 20 chapters or so is the outer, the next five are the inner, and the last are the Holy of Holies. It's fascinating, <laughs> absolutely fascinating, and it makes a lot of sense. Okay, we'll leave it there, folks. This was delightful. I wish Why you all a beautiful